All right, welcome to Columbia Physics Preceptor TV. Today we're going to talk about uh, the experiment projectile motion and conservation of energy. Uh, as you can imagine, there are two main ingredients here. One of them is conservation of energy, and the other one is projectile motion. We're going to go through conservation of energy first, and then when we're finished with that, we're going to talk a little bit about projectile motion. And at the end of those, those two uh, mini lectures, uh, we're going to talk about the actual experiment that we're going to do today. So what is energy? The real answer is that no one really knows what energy is. Uh, it's a very useful quantity to deal with in physics, because as we'll see, energy is conserved. Um, the precise meaning of that we'll, we'll see in just a second. But as of now, energy, really, no one really knows what it means. But we do know that there are several different types of energy. There's kinetic energy, and there's potential energy. There's also kind of a third type of energy, it's called heat. It's really just a type of kinetic energy, but we still distinguish between kinetic and heat. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. So when something moves, it has some amount of kinetic energy. It has certain energy stored in its motion. Potential energy is a type of energy that's stored somewhere. Something that's, it's, you can't really see it right away, like kinetic. You see something moving, you know it has kinetic energy. But potential energy is more like when you compress a spring. Even though it's not doing anything interesting when you're still compressing it, as soon as you let go of it, it has all this energy stored in the spring that it can actually do useful stuff with. So this is stored somewhere. And then this final type of energy, heat, is something that's associated with friction. So a good example for this, we're going to see an example where all these play, play a role. In fact, they're all going to play a role in today's experiment. Uh, at first, let's just consider the first two without heat. If you imagine dropping a ball, if you have some ball here, you lift it up to some height h, and you let go of it, it's going to fall down. So initially, it had all this uh, potential energy because you're lifting it up in a gravitational field, and at the end, it's, it's not lifted up at all, it's laying on the ground somewhere, or right before it hits the ground, it's, uh, it's moving at some speed. So it's kinetic. Here it has kinetic energy, and here it has potential energy. Now, the way I usually think of energy is it's like some type of fluid. It starts, and I think of these things as buckets. This potential energy is some potential energy bucket. And uh, this kinetic energy is some kinetic energy bucket. So you start in a situation where you have all this potential energy, but no kinetic. So you start in something like this. And as this falls down, you're losing more and more potential energy. So the amount of liquid or energy in this bucket is decreasing. However, it's starting to move faster, so the amount of kinetic energy is increasing. Now, the really amazing part about this is that all the energy that's lost from this bucket appears over here. So although the potential energy is not constant all the time, it changes as it moves down, nor is the kinetic energy constant, the overall energy in both buckets is always the uh, same number. It's always conserved. So as this one goes down, this one goes up. So th that's just a situation where we treat potential and kinetic energy, but no heat. We have no friction. So um, we're going to see friction later today. But before I, before I go through that, I want, I want to talk a little bit more about kinetic energy. There's another type of kinetic energy that becomes very important, especially in our experiment. Now imagine this same experiment when dropping a ball or rolling the ball down an incline. Now, the amount of uh, potential energy that a ball has up here is quantified by the formula mgh. Now, the amount of kinetic energy that something has is quantified by the formula 1 half mv squared. So the faster something moves and the more mass it has, the more kinetic energy it has. Also, the higher up you raise something and the more mass that thing has, the more potential energy this thing has. So here, you have energy mgh. It's not moving, and it's only lifted up to some height h. Here, the energy, which I'll call ef for final energy, is it has no potential energy anymore because it's not raised off the floor. However, it's now moving, so it has some kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. So since I stated before that total energy has to be conserved, this initial and this final energy must be equal. So if you look at that, M mgh and 1 half mv squared, um, you get the relationship mgh has to equal 1 half 
and v squared. Simple algebra canceling the m's, you get that the v, the speed of the ball down here, has to be the square root of 2gh. Now let's do the same thing over here. The initial height here is not moving, so it has no kinetic energy. So the initial energy is just, again, mgh. The initial height is h, initial speed is 0. Again, down here, the final um, height is 0, just like it was over here. But this time, it's going to be moving. So final energy is, again, 1 half mv squared. So you solve for this, you get the same exact expression that we got before, square root of 2gh. Now, it's a very weird thing that happens here. If you go ahead and measure the actual speed of the ball down here, you'll find that it's actually less than square root of 2gh. So the question is, why is it less? Is energy not conserved anymore? What happens to this F extra energy that's not accounted for in the 1 half mv squared? The reason is because as this moves down, unlike over here where it's just moving straight down, this time it's actually rolling. So instead of just moving along some v here, it actually has some energy associated with rotation. So as so we'll see that as soon as we account for that additional rotational energy, we'll actually see that energy is conserved. So how we, we, the, the rotational energy sh should look very similar to the kin regular kinetic energy. But you see, it shouldn't really quite depend on the speed. It shouldn't depend on how fast this thing is moving. Instead, it should d depend on how fast it's rotating. So it should depend on the angular velocity. And it shouldn't really only depend on the mass of the object, because we know that for the same mass, uh, if we have a rod that's this long and has a certain mass, or that the rod is tw you know, 20 times as long and has the same mass, they have different uh, difficulties in rotating them. So this should have, instead of mass here, there should be some geometric dependence. It should be something that has to do with the shape and stuff of the thing that you're trying to spin. And the exact formula for this is E rotational is 1 half I omega squared. This is the rot um, angular velocity. And this here is the moment of inertia. So it looks very similar to 1 half mv squared, but it's a little bit different. It has a little bit me different meaning. Now, different shapes has diff have different moment of inertias. And we know we can calculate. I'm not going to go through how to do it. But we can calculate the moment of inertia for a sphere is equal to um, let's see here, 2 fifth mr squared, mass of the sphere and the radius of the sphere. Also, we know that if this is rolling without slipping, the angular um, velocity is the speed of the ball divided by the radius. If you put these together with that formula, you'll find that the rotational energy is actually 1 fifth mv squared. So you see this extra bit of energy that we have to add in over here makes the final energy, instead of 1 half mv squared, it makes it to be um, 7 tenths mv squared. Right. So when you uh, account for this additional rotational energy, you don't find square root of 2gh anymore. You find something totally different. All right. So that's all we need. we're going to talk about conservation of energy right now. We're going to come back to a little, little uh, tricky thing about friction later on. But as of now, we're going to leave this subject and talk about projectile motion. Newton's first law states that if, um, if no forces are acting on an object, it's going to continue moving at a constant speed. So when we throw something across the room, it's changing its speed all the time, up and down. It's changing directions. Um, so its velocity is changing. And the reason. Uh, the reason for this is because there's a force acting on it. So as something falls through the, or goes through the air, there's a gravitational force, mg, acting down all the time. And according to Newton's second law, the force acting on something is equal to mass times acceleration. Now this is really, should really be a vector equation. This should have vector symbols on top of them. So it's a kind of a shorthand notation for three different equations. The x-directional force is mass times ax. The y-directional force is mass times ay. And finally, the z direction force is mass times az. In our case, if we call this the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, we'll see that there is no force in the x direction. So this is equal to 0. There is no force in the z direction. So this is equal to 0. However, in the y direction, there is a force. There is a force in the negative y direction equal to mg. So we have the negative sign out in front because it's downward, and mg is the magnitude of this, this gravitational force. So from this, we conclude that the acceleration in the x and z direction 
are equal to zero, and that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to negative g. And like you've seen in your uh, lecture course, from these equations we can derive exactly how the speed in the y direction and the x and z direction depend on time. And I'm not going to go through those derivations here, but I'm simply going to state them. Uh, the, the speed in the x direction is constant because the acceleration is zero. Same thing goes for the z direction. I'm not going to write the z direction here. Um, the x position is going to depend on time according to this formula. It's lin uh, multiply the time by the initial speed and then add your initial position. However, the y direction is a little bit more complicated because there's this acceleration in the y direction. So what you'll find is that the y velocity is not just equal to the initial velocity, it has an extra term in it. It has a term negative gt in addition to the v naught y. Also, the y um, displacement is negative one half gt squared plus v naught y t plus y naught. So if you know your initial height, y naught, you know how fast you're moving in the y direction or initially, you can from this formula comp compute the exact position in, in, the, in the y direction at any moment in time. It's pretty amazing that just from a simple formula like this, you can actually predict where a particle is going to be, just from measuring two numbers. If you want to do the same thing in the x direction, you only really need to direct, uh, um, you need to measure the initial speed in the x direction and this initial position. And you can do the same thing here. You can predict ex exactly where this particle is going to be. One last thing to mention, in our example, or in our experiment today, we're actually going to have a particle fly off an incline. So it's going to move on some incline off with some speed v. It's going to go along a projectile motion somehow. Now in this case, by instead of measuring v naught y and v naught x separately, we can actually determine them from just knowing v and this angle theta. From this triangle up here, we can see that v naught x is v naught cosine theta, and v naught y is v naught sine theta. So, like I said, just measuring v naught and cosine and sine theta separately, we can actually determine these and use in our projectile motion equations to determine the position of this, uh, this ball or particle for any future time. Okay, so that's all the theory I'm going to go over. Now I'm going to go to the actual experiment. So the device we're using today looks kind of like, let's see here, looks kind of like this. It's a little tube, and you can rotate this up and down a little bit. So if this is the floor, you can uh, adjust this height, height that we call H1, and there are two heights we need to know over here. This call, we call this H2, and there's another height in here, H3. You'll see why H3 becomes important in a second. But as of now, you know you can rotate this so you can change H2 and H1. So. If you let go of a ball over here, it's going to rush down, and assuming that this is sufficiently far, um, smaller than h1, it's going to fly out over here and hit the ground. So the goal of this experiment is to actually determine this distance, x, as a function um, by just measuring h1 and h2, and h3 actually. So the way it works, you're going to follow a four-step procedure. You're going to measure h1 and h2, and using those in conservation of energy, you'll be able to determine the speed of the ball over here. So find, in term, find v in terms of h1 and h2. Now, once you know the, uh, the speed of this ball over here, you can find the initial v, uh, speeds in the x and y direction by finding h2 and h3. By finding h2 and h3, you can actually form a little triangle in here, so you can compute what cosine and sine theta actually are. And once you know cosine and sine theta, you, and you know the speed v from part one, you can exactly compute, you can compute what v naught x and v naught y should be. Once you know that, you can uh, uh, use these, these numbers in your uh, um, projectile motion equations, to determine the time it takes this thing to land. So you have some formula for y as a function of t, so when it lands means that y is equal to zero. So this gives you the t final, the final time, the time it takes it to reach this position over here on the floor. Now, 
you can use this time tf in your, in your x equations to compute the distance x that this thing travels. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to do this. You're going to measure h1 and h2 and h3, determine all these things, and figure out what x should be. And you're going to compare that with the experiment. Now, if you only did it like this, you'd find that you'd actually fall a little short. You, you'd predict a larger value for x and would actually appear. And this is very similar to what happened before when we predicted the final speed of this ball rolling down the incline. We thought it was going to be much larger than it was. And the reason was there was this extra rotational energy that we forgot to take account, in, to take account of. And as soon as we did that, we saw that the experimental theory matched up perfectly. The same thing is going on here. So the question is, what is this additional uh, energy that we're mis uh, missing? And it's actually friction. This is where friction becomes important. When this thing rolls down here, it actually is touching this tube the entire time, so it's losing some energy to friction. So when you're setting the initial and final energy equal to each other, and you're not including this friction energy, this energy that went, kind of got lost on the way, you think that you have much more kinetic energy at the end than you actually do. So we're going to figure out a way to quantify how much friction is lost, subtract that out of our equation. So we kind of modify step one up here. By modifying step one, we find V in terms of H1 and H2 and some other parameters that we're about to explain. So what we do is we align this in such a way that even if you let go of this up here, it doesn't make it out on the other side. In theory, without friction, you'd have to make H1 and H2 equal to each other in order to achieve that. But because of friction, H2 can be a little bit smaller than H1, and it still will turn around at the edge. At that point, we know that the difference in potential energy has to equal the friction. So mgh1 is equal to mgh2 plus friction. So we do this, and we measure h1 and h2. We'll call those values h1 prime and h2 prime. And we can actually measure the friction in terms of these h1 and h2 prime. So V here shouldn't be in terms of h1 and h2. It should be in terms of h1, h2, h1 prime, and h2 prime. And then everything is the same. You can find x here as a function, or x depending on what your original heights were. The only little thing that you should think about here is you're going to do this with three different balls, a plastic, aluminum, and a heavy metal ball. And they all are going to um, lose a different amount of energy to friction, so you have to redo this h prime thing every, for every single ball. But other than that, that's, that's pretty much the experiment, so good luck.